So we just need to remember the basic structure of the earth. So we've got the core, the mantle, and the crust. And we've got all those different plate margins as well. So we've got two different types of crust around the earth. We've got the oceanic crust and the continental crust. Oceanic is thin, whereas the continental is thick. The oceanic is five to 10 kilometers, whereas the continental is 20 to 200. The main thing we need to remember is oceanic is dense. So therefore, when continental plates meet, uh, it will be sinking, whereas the continental crust is less dense, so again it won't be forced down and we won't see subduction. So here is just a basic diagram of all the different plate margins around the world, and we need to think about which direction some of these plate margins are moving. Now I'm just going to highlight a couple, you might want to look back at your notes. So I would take a good note of where the Pacific plate and Philippine plates meet the Eurasian plates because we're going to see movement together and that's where we see those destructive plate margins. Another good example looking at constructive plate margins is in Iceland where those two plates, the North American plate and the Eurasian plate are moving apart from each other. A last really good example is California. So we've got those conservative plate margins uh, moving from side to side between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. Now when we do a comparison of where the major volcanoes are around the world, you can see there is some correlation between where they are and where the plate margins are. So we tend to see that earthquakes and volcanoes occur near these plate margins around the world. I'm going to quickly recap the different plate boundaries. So we've got destructive, constructive and conservative. So destructive plate margins, again, are moving towards each other. One is forced down and therefore we get subduction. We get lots of volcanoes and hilly areas in these margins. The next one is the constructive plate margin where they're moving apart from each other. We get new land being formed from the volcanic activity. And the last one is the conservative plate margins, which are rubbing against each other. They could be traveling similar directions, but at just different rates. There's a variety of different case studies you could have looked at. And I'm just going to highlight a couple examples. You might want to go back and look at your notes or look at the revision guide that you've got to check that you're checking out the correct case study. But overall, you need to remember primary and secondary effects for these case studies, as well as the immediate and long-term responses. So you need to make sure you know the, the details for the case studies that you're going to be talking about. My classes have been looking at the Italian earthquake from 2009 and the Nepalese earthquake from 2015. So primary effects are as a direct result of the earthquake, whereas secondary effects are a knock-on effect. Some of the primary effects you can include is death rates, how many people are injured, as well as how many people are made homeless. It could also be buildings collapsing or being destroyed. In Italy, there was hospitals damaged, as well as damage to the university. Secondary effects, again, uh, we could see landslides and rock falls after the earthquake. Uh, we also saw university student numbers decrease as well as lack of housing and that meant house prices rose in the area. When we're looking at immediate responses that means the things that happen within the days and weeks after a disaster whereas long-term responses usually take months or years and usually involves rebuilding or restructuring the area. Some of the examples for Italy that we saw is again the Italian Red Cross searching for survivors, temporary hospitals being constructed, uh, also stuff like mortgages, bills um, were suspended and again lots of help and aid from the government. Long-term responses in Italy included uh, no tax for the residents, so hopefully they'll have a bit more money to spend in the local area and help the economy. They rebuilt historical buildings and also investigated the uh, causes of the earthquake. When we have a look at the Nepalese earthquake from 2015, you'll see very different numbers when it comes to the death toll, injuries and people being homeless. And you should have two contrasting case studies that you can talk about the differences. So some of the primary effects were again over 8,000 dead, 16,000 injured. We had lots of damage to historical buildings and temples. 
Uh, we had the destruction of 26 hospitals and a lot of the schools. So again, if all the hospitals are destroyed, there's not gonna be anywhere to help the injured. There was a shortage of water, food, electricity area, and there was lots of aftershocks, which again, caused a lot more damage. Some of the secondary effects saw uh, avalanches on Everest, which again took the lives of some of the climbers in the area. Um, tourism took a real big dip. So tourism um, is really important for places like Nepal. And a large percentage of their GDP um, is made up from tourism. So lots of people's jobs are affected if there's no tourists. So restaurants, hotels, Sherpas in the area won't actually be able to earn any money. Immediate responses saw lots of international aid Temporary shelters were set up and the Red Cross was searching for survivors again. It was also very difficult to get help and aid to the very remote areas because traveling was severely affected. Some of the long-term responses were again, lots of aid and help from lots of different countries around the world. Um, the heritage sites and the tourist attractions were opened as soon as possible later on that year, which again helped that local economy as well. That's just a quick review of the case studies that you need to know for this course. If you've studied anything different, you need to go back and look at your notes, look at your textbooks or revision guides and make sure you understand the details for each different case study. Again, the examiners want to see that you've actually studied these things and you know your stuff. So any more figures, names, countries, specific details you can include in your answer, the more marks you're gonna get. Now the last key topic for today is uh, how can we reduce the risk uh, of these disasters becoming worse in the future? So we've got the three P's, which is protection, prediction, and planning. So protection thinks about how we can protect the area, whether it's buildings and how they're actually constructed. So a lot of HICs in the world have got lots of technology in their buildings to be able to withstand earthquakes but lots of LICs don't have that technology and that's why we see higher death tolls in some of these poorer countries. Now, when it comes to prediction, lots of scientists have got lots of different um, equipment that can try and predict these earthquakes. If countries invest a lot more in the prediction element, they can warn their residents and prepare them further in advance. Again, what we see in HICs, there's a lot of investment in prediction methods, but LICs just don't have the money to invest in that area. And again, that's where we see the greater effect in the LICs. The last point is planning. So uh, again, if there's lots of planning procedures um, when it comes to how they're gonna react and respond, if there is an event, again, how they construct the areas, can people get through and evacuate quickly? The more planning from the local authorities um, before these events happen, the faster and more efficient they can react to it. So that's quite a quick summary of a lot of different information you need to know on tectonic hazards. Again, I'd really suggest you go back and look at your notes, look at your revision guides and go over those points again. I, I can't express how important it is you know these case studies really well and can refer to them. Um, but also you've got to do some practice questions to make sure you apply the right knowledge. It's really important that you can decipher between an effect and a response because that is a common mistake we see in lots of pupils. So that's it for episode three of Sunday Morning Coffee. Again, I really want to know if these videos are useful. So again, give this video a like. Uh, again, follow me on social media. Just really let me know if you find them uh, to be useful, help you with your revision. Uh, again, make sure you subscribe because then it goes straight into your feed. Again, thanks for watching. Have a great week.